All right. Well, hello to everybody out there in outer space. Welcome to another Dig Agency training video. My name is Joe Bushalaki. I am the program director and the coach of the face-to-face -face career program at the Dig Agency. The face-to-face -face career program is the face-to-face -face free lead program. We give agents fresh, exclusive, final expense insurance leads. You do not have to pay a penny for them. And you just go out there and you work them and you make money and we're all happy. So let's just jump into this. So in this video, I am going to, I'm going to break down our entire face-to-face -face presentation. I will tell you, you need to focus on how to get into the door. That is every salesperson's problem, getting enough people to see. But once you're in front of uh, somebody and they're willing to have a conversation with you, you need to know how to close them. So we have our way of doing things and I'm going to break down all of the sections and the steps to that. So, all right, let's get into it. I'm going to share my screen and we are going to get into it. So here's the final expense face-to-face -face presentation script at the Dig Agency. What is the first thing we do when we get into a house? We do rapport building. So we get into a house. Uh, I do want to focus on something before I get into the actual rapport. You see this part where it says direct the client to go sit at the kitchen table with you? and begin walking in that direction. When you go into a house, everyone, you need to set the tone. You know, We need to show leadership and authority with a smile, not be polite and permissible. So when you get into a house, everybody, don't say, hey, may I please sit at your table or ask the person, where are we going to sit at? No, you tell them, say, hey, let's go here and sit at the kitchen table and I'll put down my folder or maybe even the couch. Hey, it looks like this is where you sit right there, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones. I'm gonna sit right here and we'll get started. And just be the leader, you know, just have a smile when you do it. Okay, but rapport, that is the first stage of the script. So what is rapport? Rapport is, uh, it's an icebreaker. We just talk about whatever under the sun. We can talk about the, the, the grandkids. We can talk about the, their favorite hobby. If you're running Facebook leads, that's a good one. Uh, sometimes I go in there and I say, hey, have you been living in the county your whole life. We're just doing a little bit of small talk, right? Okay. Why do we do this? We do it because we want to bridge the trust gap between, you know, prospect and salesperson. And we need to start putting someone's guard down. So when we start to ask uncomfortable questions about death, these people will give us real emotional answers, not just dry answers with their guard up and acting defensive. So how long should rapport take from a time standpoint? At most two or three minutes in a home, we don't need to get into some big conversation. And I will tell you, if you get into a house and the person is just chatting away like they've known you for 30 years, which they do, uh, you know, after about 30 seconds, I'm ready to go right into the introduction. So how do we know if we have done enough ice breaking. Well, if they're laughing, if they're chuckling, if they're smiling, like I said, if they're talking a lot. And then the cool thing about being a face-to-face -face agent is that we can look at their body language. So if they're nice and relaxed in their chair and they're just talking to you, great. But if their arms are all folded and they're all tight-lipped like they're sitting on a block of ice, well, hey, maybe we need to talk about the weather and the grandkids for another minute or two. Now, hear this, just as important as it is to break the ice with the prospect, it is just as important to make sure that you're not letting rapport go for too long. If you talk about the weather and the grandkids and their favorite hobby for 20 minutes, as opposed to just talking, it, talking about it for two minutes, you're going to get what's called a diminishing return. That extra 18 minutes that you spent talking about just pretty much nothing, it's not going to get you any closer to the sale. And here's the more risky part about letting rapport go for too long. You do not want to give the impression that you have nothing else to do. You know, people respect busy professionals, okay? So if you act like you have nothing to do all day, but just hang out with this one person, they're eventually going to get comfortable with that. And you know what's going to happen? 
that's going to make them feel more comfortable at the end when you start closing and asking for the business. It's going to make them more comfortable saying they want to think about it because in their head, they're like, hey, you look like you have nothing to do but hang out with me all day. You know, we had a great conversation for two hours. You know what? Why don't you call me back, Mr. or Miss Insurance Agent? Call me back and come over tomorrow. We can talk again for two hours. So you want to act like you are a busy professional. That doesn't mean act like a jerk and be like, hey, hurry up. I got things to do. No, it means we need to keep the conversation moving forward. Got to keep the marker moving forward. We got to keep centering the conversation back to what is important, which is the topic of insurance. Now, on the flip side of the coin with rapport, and then we'll move forward, we need to make sure that rapport is all about the prospect and not about us. You know, as salespeople, we are like professional conversationalists. We know how to warm up to a stranger in, you know, 0.3 seconds. So what I hear from agents when they're building rapport, a lot of times they're just talking about themselves, man. It's easy to fall into this trap. Let's say the person's favorite hobby is baseball and you like baseball and you start going off about your team and all the games you like and 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 how you know your team traded a player maybe to the prospects team and you're just going on and on for two minutes just rambling and they're just sitting there chuckling like "Uh uh-huh uh-huh yeah you don't want to do that you want to ask open-ended questions to get them talking that's the point of the rapport building section get these people talking get them to start putting their guard down. So you need to, if we're, if, if you're going to talk about baseball, you just say, okay, who's your favorite team? Oh, it's great. How long you've been following them? When was the last time you went to a game in person? Oh, great. How was that? Who's your favorite player? What's the, what's the, in your opinion, the best baseball game you ever seen in your life? Just stuff like that. You know what I mean? Get them to start talking, get, you know, at least act like you're interested in what they have to say. And we should be to some degree, you know, we want to be genuine, right? Okay. So you get through the report. Last on the short end, 30 seconds on the long, uh, on the long end, maybe three minutes. Okay. Now we get to the introduction. And there's basically three points in the introduction. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to read the introduction because it's really quick. Okay. All right. So now I know a little bit about you. Let me tell you more about why I'm here. My name is Joe Bushalaki. I'm a licensed life insurance agent in California. I specialize in helping people age 50 and older get affordable life insurance to cover things like final expenses, burials, cremation costs, that sort of thing. Here's a copy of my license. Shows that I am uh, th- that I have been approved to talk about these programs in the state. And the reason why clients do business with me is because I'm what's known as a broker, meaning I shop the major insurance companies to get you the best bang for the buck. Make sense? There it is. There's your introduction. What I like to do in the introduction is I like to hand over my business card. That's kind of like my style. Uh, But what we're telling them is one, we're a specialist. We help people 50 and older. And two, we tell them that we are, that we are a life insurance agent. We show our license. It it gives a a little bit of trust. You know, what for the first couple of years of running leads, I never used to show my license, but then I started doing it. And you know what? I think it's actually a very effective, quick thing we can do. I see the look in their eye when they see my my license. And and to show you what I do is I I have it laminated, I have it printed. You know, it's a really cool thing right here, man. And I just show it to them real quick. And uh, I think it, I think it adds a little pizzazz to the whole thing, and it's in the script, so you should do it. So we tell them we specialize. We're a specialist. That's important. We specialize in helping people fifty and older get affordable life insurance. We show them that we're a life insurance agent, and tell them, and then we tell them that we're a broker, that we have options for a lot of different programs out there. And we get people the best bang for the buck. So that's the intro. It's pretty, pretty short and sweet. Just, moving forward okay now this is where we're going to spend a little time at everybody the pre-qualifying conversation it pretty much starts right here but what is the pre-qualifying conversation that is where we do all of the heavy lifting in the presentation i am going to tell you the most important section of the script 
is the pre-qualifying conversation. It is the wants and the needs of the prospect. It is the why. Why did they fill out the form? And it's the problem. What is the problem for the prospect? Well, it's if you die tomorrow, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, what financial problems are you going to be leaving to your loved ones? Which in final expense is pretty simple. What financial burden are you going to be leaving to your loved ones to pay for your funeral cremation or final expenses? Okay. There's two separate conversations we have in the pre-qualifying conversation. Stick with me here. There's the why conversation, which is why did you fill out the form? And then there's the problem conversation where we figure out what's the problem. Because as insurance agents, I don't care if you're selling life insurance, health insurance, auto insurance, whatever it is, insurance agents solve a problem, okay? So the first part of this uh, of initiating the pre-qualifying is awesome. So the reason I'm, I'm here, this is actually a typo right here, guys. It says I call. It's actually should say I'm here. So awesome. Well, the, the reason I'm here is because you requested info on our final expense programs through Facebook. And most people want the info because they're worried about how expensive funeral and burial costs have become. And they want to plan to give them peace of mind. So my question to you is this, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect. What were your thoughts and concerns that caused you to request the information? This is like our, our signature question in the agency, man. What were your thoughts and concerns that caused you to request the information? Typically, when you ask that, well, I don't want to say typically, but a lot of times you're not going to get like an emotional answer where the person's wearing their heart on their sleeve. You might get... A question you might get an answer like oh i was just curious about the program or yeah i just don't want to be a burden to my kids or yeah i just want to be i want to be cremated and you know i i, I don't want my i i want to i want to be able to take care of it i don't know uh, but if they're not wearing their heart on their sleeve and they don't just go into this big story about you know somebody just passing away or whatever you need to go to this next question well mr or mrs prospect that makes perfect sense why you would send this back. But here's the thing. What I'm really interested in learning is what has happened in your life recently that has made you decide now is the time to seriously look at getting final expense coverage. That question is going to bring a little more of something out. So this is the why conversation that we're having right now. Why did you fill out the form? I will tell you the primary goal of the why conversation is to find out what event happened recently that has made them request the information. If you can find what happened exactly that caused them to, to fill out this form, you are going to strike an emotional chord in this person and you're going to get them to start lowering their defenses. And this is where the real rapport and connection starts. So I want to tell you something, you know, we have the first stage, it's called the rapport stage. I really, I feel like it should just be called the icebreaker because that's all we're doing is breaking the ice. The real rapport and connection is when somebody says, you know, my brother just passed away a couple of months ago and you start talking about that. That's why they filled out the form. Now we're really starting to connect. You know, now they're really starting to warm up to you. This is why the why conversation is so important. Now, even with these two questions, what were your thoughts and concerns that caused you to request the information? And even after this, even this one, well, that makes perfect sense why you'd send this back. What I'm really interested in learning is what has happened recently in your life that has made you decide now is the time to seriously look into getting final expense coverage. Sometimes they'll still just give you dry answers and say, hey, I was just curious about the program. So you need to, you need to dig a little bit. The, the two most common reasons, I will tell you the three most, the third one's kind of a far third, but uh, definitely... The two most common reasons that people fill out the form is, is one, somebody died recently, or two, they had some type of health scare or health issue that happened. And the third one that's kind of a far third, but it, it pops up, is like someone got into an accident. They got a, a car wreck or something, or they know somebody who got into an accident. So uh, somebody dying recently, witnessing a funeral, having to orchestrate one, a health issue that happened, 
maybe they went to the hospital or maybe they just got the news from at a doctor's appointment that they have this new issue coming up on them. Uh, those are the two main ones that make people fill out this form. And then the accidents happen sometimes too. So the theme is to make them relive the why. If, if someone passed away in their life, we need to ask them some questions about it. You know, how, how did, how did the final expenses get paid for? How did it feel having to go through all of that? How much of a struggle was it to pay for that person's final expenses? If they had life insurance, the, the, the person that died, you say, man, how much easier did that make it on everybody to, to pay for everything? And then you can kind of flip it and you can say, man, what would it have been like if they did not have life insurance? With the health scares and the accidents, you can make them relive this stuff. You could, If they said, yeah, I... I I had a health scare a couple months ago. I had some chest pains and went to the hospital. You can say, man, what was it like when you were having the chest pains? What was going through your mind? Who were you thinking about the most? You know, after you got out the hospital, how relieved were you that you were okay? You know, stuff like that. But the whole goal of the why is we make them relive the why. We have a conversation about it, okay? And you want to the best of your ability, find out the most you want to find the most recent event because sometimes you'll ask what were your thoughts and concerns that caused you to request the information and they'll start talking about somebody that like passed away like 10 years ago and that's cool and all but that's not necessarily why they fill out the form you know it's 10 years ago like for me i want something that happened like in the last 90 days if i can at at minimum can i get something that was in the last year you know what i mean but really people fill out forms because something happened like last week yesterday, last month, maybe a couple months ago, stuff like that. You know what I mean? Now, here's the thing. Remember this, guys. Yes, the primary goal is to find the event that just happened that made them fill out the form. But if we can't get an event, it's okay. Let me give you a, a, a cool question to ask, a cool trick. Not even a trick, just the next best thing we can talk about. It's this question. What experiences have you had dealing with, with funerals in your family? And maybe they'll talk about, you know, when they, their parents died 20 years ago. And you can talk, you can make them relive it. You know, oh, what was it like uh, when, when, your, when mom passed away? How did everything get paid for? You know, how, uh, if, she, if, if mom didn't have anything in place, man, what was it like? How, how did everyone come up with the cash? How, how did you feel when you found out that she didn't have anything? You know, stuff like that. Or, or like I said, if she had life insurance, man, how much easier that make it on make it on you and your family that your mom prepared for everything? You know, what would it have been like if she didn't have that? Man, what would you guys have done? You know, but keep in mind we're making relive stuff. You know, and here's the thing: at the end of the day, if all we're getting out of the why conversation is an experience that they had about a funeral that they dealt with 20 years ago, well, you know what? couple things have happened. One, we've still built rapport and connection. You know what I mean? We talked about something with the prospect that was meaningful in their lives, obviously your parents dying or whatever they say. And then, you know what the, the next thing that we're doing is we're having a conversation about death. We're, we're having a conversation about death to usher in a conversation about the prospect's death. You know what I mean? So to sum this up, the why conversation, what's the primary objective? find out the event that happened that made them fill out the form. If we can't accomplish the primary objective, it's okay, man. What's the secondary objectives? Well, if we, we can build rapport and connection by talking about something that had to do with death, even if it was years ago, and we're having a conversation about death, we are, we are conditioning the prospect to move forward into the next conversation, which is the problem conversation. OK, so let's get into that. So you had the why conversation. Now we're going to go over to the problem conversation. Two distinct conversations, OK, in the pre-qualifying conversation as a whole, if that makes sense. Uh, so here's here's the first question. What do you have in place to pay for the burden of your final expenses? Let's say they have nothing. I'm going to use cut and dry answers here, like simplified things. Because obviously, sometimes you say, what do you have in place to pay for the burden of your final expenses? And maybe, I don't know, maybe they got 100000 in the bank. I don't know. But uh, that, that'll be some, some more training for another day. But just for the sake of just showing you how to, 
how to how to how to sell a deal with our script. This is this is uh, the first question. What do you have in place to pay for the burden of your final expenses? Let's say they say they have nothing. You drop down to this question right here. This is this is the uh, th this is like the Academy Award winning question. We go wow. Well, God forbid if you die today, how would your family take care of this burden? And, you know, you can play around with the words. You can say, well, wow, you don't have anything in place. Okay, well, if, if you die today, how will your family take care of this burden? Okay, I'm going to tell you, everyone, if you've ever heard Dave Duford say in any of his training videos, hold their feet to the fire, it's this part right here. This part right here that we're getting into, this is the most important part of the entire presentation is this part right here, okay? Put it this way. If the why conversation and the problem conversation are the cornerstones of the presentation, which they are, the core of the cornerstone is this part about the problem. How is your family going to take care of this burden? You know what they're going to say a lot of times? They're going to say, I don't know. You should follow up and ask, well, who's going to have to deal with it? Who's going to have to pay for it? A lot of times they're going to say they're kids, right? Here's the next question. This is it. This is it, guys. This is the most, this is, this is it. You need to ask them, how are your kids going to pay for this? And you need to sit right here and hold their feet to the fire until they give you a real answer. I don't know is not a real answer. Okay. So they say, I don't know how my kids are going to pay for it. You know what you need to ask next? The same question and just keep rewarding it. You could say, okay, well, you know, I know it's tough, but they have to do something. How are your kids going to come up with the cash? I don't know what they're going to do. Okay, well, if you had to guess, what would be the option for them? They need to answer it. Do not move forward in the presentation if they keep saying, I don't know. If they say, I don't know, and you move forward, you let them off the hook because these people, they need to take ownership of a problem. That's how insurance is sold. They take ownership of saying, if I die, my kids are going to have to pay for it by doing X, and that could be a problem. So make them say it. I don't care if you have to ask them, how are your kids going to come up with the money 11 times? Until they give a real answer, they're going to have to take a loan out. They're going to have to do a GoFundMe. They're going to have to dip into their savings. They're going to have to do car washes. I don't know, whatever it is, until they actually say it. And here's another thing, guys, that I hear agents mess up on. Don't feed these people answers, okay? Don't, when they say, I don't know how my kids are going to pay for it, don't say, okay, well, do you think they're going to have to do a GoFundMe? Do you think they're going to have to do a car wash? No, 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 no. Just play it cool. Make them say it. Make them think of it in their brain and filter it out of their mouth and come up with the answer because that's how they'll take ownership. So let's say you finally, I hope you get it the first time, but let's, I think on average, it seems like it takes about, about two, three times to ask that question. How, how are they going to pay for this? And they'll finally give a real answer. Hold their feet to the fire, man. Do it. Do it for you, you and you making your money and do it to help these families. It's about both. It's about you making money and you helping people, okay? This whole thing about it's not about the money, man, I don't know who you, hey, I'm just keeping it real, man. I don't know who you're fooling, okay? We didn't get in this business just to not make money, but it's, it's about both, okay? It's about both. If it really ain't about the money, you know what? Go be a missionary across the world for free, and then I'll maybe believe that it's not about the money, okay? But it's about you making a living to feed your family, and it's about you saving this family from having a nightmare. So do everybody a service in this section and make them say it. Do not let them off the hook, okay? This is the most important thing I'm teaching you today. Right, right here, right here, right now, at this very moment in time, hold their feet to the fire like David Duford said. Amen. Okay. So let's just say they say, oh, my kids are going to have to take out, they're going to have to charge up a credit card. Then you want to, you want to, this is where you can bring the pain on this stuff. And, you know, keep in mind, we want to be compassionate. You know, we're showing tough love and we're, we're trying to open their eyes up. And so we could say, 
we can ask them how, how are the kids going to feel about that in fact i think it's uh it's this question right here how would they take it if they found out it was all on them or or what you can say this is what you say how did how will your kids feel having to charge up a credit card to pay for your final expenses so ask how, how ask the prospect how they think the kids are going to feel about that and then just as important ask them how they feel yeah how do you feel about your kids having to struggle and go through all that okay ask how it's going to get paid for ask how the people that are going to have to pay for it are going to feel and ask the prospect how they feel about that you know what i mean this is the problem conversation this sells the deal okay so we've had the why conversation we've had the problem conversation we're still in the pre-qualifying section as a whole, right? Well, now we're going to close out the pre-qualifying section with this part right here. First question, what do you want your new life insurance policy to accomplish? And guys, I want to say in a side note, don't be all finicky about this. Be assumptive. Ask them straight up, what would you want your new life insurance policy to accomplish? I hear agents say like, like eggshell talk, like walking on eggshell talk. They'll be like, well, if you did buy a policy or if you do decide to do something today, what would you life, want your life insurance policy to accomplish? Don't, don't say all that, that beginning stuff, all that fluff. You know what I mean? Ask them straight up. You know, with, that, with everything we talked about, Mr. Jones, what do you want your new life insurance policy to accomplish? You know what I mean? Who do you want your beneficiary to be on this new policy? And why is that? Then we do a summary statement. This is very important. Don't skip the review. This is a review. You know what's cool about the review? The rev if, when you summarize everything, one, you're going to show that you're a good listener. And two, you're going to show you know what you're doing. I will If you do a good review, and don't make it super long, but you do a good review, you touch on everything that you talked about the, fa the past few minutes, which probably was very emotional for the prospect, you touch on that all real, qu real quick and, 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 and cover all the points, you're going to see the look in their eye and, they're gonna, and, and then they're going to agree with you. So it goes something like this. It's going to, example, okay, so just to kind of do a review here, you know, you, your brother passed away, uh, so-and-so had to pay for it. It was a struggle. You don't have anything in place right now. You said if you're if you die tomorrow, your kids are gonna have to charge up a credit card. You don't want that to happen. You want something in place so that whoever the beneficiary is gonna be is, is gonna be able to pay for it. There's gonna be no problem. Is that right? And they're gonna go, yep, exactly, exactly. And they're they're gonna realize at that point, like, wow, man, this 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 agent is professional and they're listening to me. And that's what people want, man. That's what people want. You know, I will tell you, uh, people in general, the public, consumers. They, they don't really mind if you're saying a script. They really don't. Just, just as long as they get the impression that the, the sales professional is listening to, to everything they have to say, sales or customer service, just as long as they get the impression that the person on the other end uh, uh, of the phone or in person is, is listening to what they have to say, they'll put up with the script, man. They don't care about that. After that, we close out the pre-qualifying conversation with the glad to hear statement. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear this is a concern for you, Mrs. Jones. It's crazy to think how many people are out there that do not care about their family and are willing to make it their problem, right? And then they're going to agree. And, and we want to say it like that because it's kind of like saying, man, it's crazy people that just put this all off on their kids, right? And they say, yeah. So you know what? At the, <laughs> at the end, when they don't want to buy life insurance, it's like, man, you're like one of these people. You know, and you don't necessarily have to throw that in their face at the end, but they'll be thinking about that. Okay. All right. So there's the pre-qualifying conversation, the why conversation, why'd you fill out the form, the problem conversation. If you die tomorrow, what financial problems are you going to leave to your loved ones? You need to make them say it. How are they going to pay for it, man? That is the most important thing out of everything. Okay. All right. Get it. Got it. Good. Okay. Moving along the bank draft question. Okay, well, I got two more questions, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect. First, since the company doesn't send me out to collect the money like in the old days, they require everyone paying monthly to set up either a draft from their local checking, savings account, or debit card account like a Green Direct Express card. Which one do you have? Why is this important? 
because there's basically two ways that people get their social security. They either get it from their bank, or if you don't have a bank account, you get one of those government issued direct express cards. It's a little green master card. Here's the thing. Not all insurance companies take direct express cards. So if they don't have a bank account and they only have a direct express card, you need to be mindful of that when you're picking out carriers. Okay. It's only a few that offer direct express or that, uh, uh, that will collect the direct express payment, I should say. Also on a side note, if someone says they have a bank account, you know, in 2024, uh, there's people that have these like online bank accounts. I don't mean online banking where you like log into your your local bank from a website, look at your balance stuff. I'm talking about the online bank accounts, you know, the checklist checking accounts. They're basically when someone go gets gets a prepaid card at, at like the store or something. And those prepaid cards, they're attached to a bank account. But there's like these online bank accounts that don't have like a brick and mortar office anywhere. They're not like the big traditional companies. So if someone says they have a bank account, you need to decipher whether they bank locally or they have one of these like online checklist checking accounts. Because once again, not all companies, not all insurance carriers will allow a checklist checking account online bank account. They'll only take local bank accounts, brick and mortar offices, the traditional stuff. So you got to decipher all that. Then we want to get into the budget. Hey, everybody, we sell, we sell final expense insurance to low income seniors. A lot of them are only on disability or social security. We need to be mindful of their budget. We need to be sensitive to it. You do not want to, you do not want to have these people pay more than they can afford. Remember, this is the insurance business. They're not signing a contract. It's not about what you sell. It's about what you keep. You need to, you need to sell insurance at a monthly payment that they can afford so they keep paying it the rest of their life. Okay? So you got the budget question. All right. Thank you. Well, my final question is about price. So look, nine out of 10 people I see, they draw a disability or retired. Everyone I see is on a fixed income service prospect. Like you, they all want life insurance, but they got to make sure they can afford it, right? Because what's the point of having a policy that's too much that you're going to drop in six months? That's just a waste of money. The truth is the best policy to have is the one that's going to be there when you die. The one that's going to be there when you die is the one that you know that you can comfortably afford. So while I've seen plans that cost as much as $400 a month, if I can qualify you for a program we offer today, can you afford somewhere between $150 to $200 a month? So this last part right here. So while I've seen plans that cost as much as $400 a month, why do we say that? We're kind of, what we're doing is we're uh, anchoring. Uh, we're we're, we're kind of making an anchor where we're doing the budget. And you know, and here's the thing, we ain't lying. These people, they get like a term plan or one of these like like higher end type of insurance policies. It's going to be 400 bucks a month. You'd be surprised. A 75 year old who wants a 10 year term for like whatever amount of money, man, the prices are crazy. So that's factual. So you say, after you say, well, I've seen some plans that cost as much as $400 a month. If I can qualify you for a program we offer today, can you afford somewhere between 150 and $200 a month? Start at $150 to $200 a month, everyone. Do not prejudge what somebody can afford. Even if you go into somebody's house and it looks like they can only afford 20 bucks a month, just start at $150 to $200 a month. You'll be surprised on how many people, it's not a whole lot, but they're out there. People that live below their means, you know, someone that lives in a, in a, in a, in a small trailer mobile home or something, a little modular or something like that. And you think they can't afford anything and they can afford 150 to $200 a month. Two big lessons with the budget. Here they are. First one, words matter. Ask the questions as they, as they are, they are written in the script. And the second, the, the, the second rule is any answer the prospect gives except for a solid yes is a no. I'm going to repeat that. Any answer the prospect gives that is not a solid yes is a no, okay? So let's say I, I ask the prospect, if I qualify you for a program we offer today, can you afford somewhere between 150 to $200 a month? They go, no, I can't do that. 
Too much, no problem. If I can qualify you for another program we offer today, can you afford 100 to $125 per month? Let's say they say, oh, you know, 125 is kind of high, but 100 bucks, I could probably do 100 bucks. Okay, off script. Saying the answer, I can probably do 100 bucks a month, does that mean they can afford it? Is that a solid yes? No, it's not. That's not. Probably and yes, I can afford are two different things. Okay. So don't get fooled when they say, oh, I can afford a hundred bucks. I could probably afford a hundred bucks a month. And you're being a greedy agent who wants all the money. So you're like, okay, great. A hundred bucks. Sounds good. And that'll come back to haunt you at the end. Well, I'll talk about that in a second. But if they say I can probably afford a hundred bucks a month, coach them down, man. We got to be sensitive. We got to say, okay, is a hundred bucks. Is that still kind of high? Mr. Mr. Prospect? Yeah, it's kind of a little bit high. Okay. If I can qualify you for another program we offer today, can you afford somewhere between 50 to $75 a month? Yes, I can afford that. I can afford that. And then we want to ask them a second time. Perfect. So you're saying that in that range, uh, 50 to $75 a month, you can definitely afford that. And they say, yes, I can. Okay, now you got you got a good budget range. Okay, back to the first rule about words matter. Everybody ask the questions the way they're worded. If I can qualify you for a program we offer today, can you afford X or Y dollar amounts per month? Okay, can you afford it per month? That's how you need to ask them. Don't, don't ask questions like, hey, if I can qualify you for a program we offer today, can you afford $100 to $125? How's that sound? Maybe they'll say that sounds good. So let's kind of deep, dive deeper. Let's say the person said, I can't afford 150 to 100 to, I can't afford 150 to $200 per month. And you say, hey, too much, no problem. Uh, what about 100 to 125? How does that sound? And the prospect says, yeah, that sounds better. But what does that really mean sounds better? Like, you know, hey, you know, 100, 125 sounds better. Doesn't mean I can afford it but it sounds better to 150 to $200 a month. You catch my drift. You, you don't want to be like that. You need to ask people, if I can qualify you for this amount or this amount, can you afford that per month? Can you afford it? I don't care if it sounds better. I didn't ask you, you know, how does that sound or, or any of that. I asked you, can you afford it per month? And you need to ask them, can you afford this per month? It's got to be definitive. Make sure you, the reason that we have the budget question in the middle of the presentation is because that's the last thing we want to hear at the end when we say the close and ask for the business is that they say, well, let me check my budget. Let me see what I can afford. Uh, we don't have to go all there at the end. No, you, you clearly told me you can afford 50 to $75 a month. So I'm going to show you plans for that much. You know what I mean? So make sure you get the budget. And if you have to keep going down, I got no shame in my game, man. If you can afford 20 bucks a month, 15 bucks a month, I'll show it to you if I can, okay? It's about, like Dave Duford says, it's about activity, not necessarily how big the case sizes are. Activity, applications, okay? So we've established the budget. Now we are in stage three, the positioning, okay? So stage three, what do we do? We talk about how it never cancels due to age or health and the rates don't ever go up. Hey, let's just say it. Now that I know where you stand on budget, it's important to understand how my programs to cover your final expenses work and how they're much better than the other options. So first off, your coverage never cancels due to age or health. You simply pay the premium and you'll always be covered no matter if you pass at 75 or 115. And this is great because unlike term insurance plans, you know, like you got AARP's New York Life or Globe Life Insurance, uh, your, your plans with uh, your plan with me is never going to cancel. And second, your price is guaranteed never to increase. You will always pay the same premium each month without ever having to go through a price in increase either. Sound good? Okay, bottom line, your coverage is as certain as, as a sunrise. As long as you pay, your coverage starts right away and you can never be canceled. Everything I described makes sense? So why do we bring up those two companies? Because they mass mail seniors 
with term insurance plans. Now, here's the thing. They might have whole life plans, but they don't lead with those. They lead with term insurance plans. So I'm going to talk about the plans that these companies are leading with. And they get mail from these people all the time. So they need to know that the, the, the coverage is never going to cancel with us. The rate is not ever going to go up. Very important, man. It's a simple product. You have it the rest of your life and you start out paying 50 bucks a month. It's always going to be 50 bucks a month forever. No fees or taxes or any of that stuff. So that's talking about the product. Then what are we going to do? We're going to get into the health questions and underwriting. Perfect. Let me ask you some health questions to see your options. Please answer these questions honestly. So what we do is we actually have a general health questionnaire at the DIG agency. I'm actually going to bring it up right now. We have a, we have a general health questionnaire. Just ask all of these questions as they're worded. And once you do that, then you need to, you need to know about everyone's, these people's medications. Now, just like in a lot of things we do, you want to say, hey, Mrs. Jones, go ahead and get your medications and spell out the medication names, okay? Tell them to go get their medications. Don't say, hey, do you happen to know where your medications are or can I look at your medications? Tell them to go get them, okay? You ask the general health questions and you get the medications. Now, once you do that, you can either do the traditional way of picking out a carrier, the traditional way of field underwriting, where you are looking at agent guides and medication guides and, you know, looking at the application uh, to see what the questions are and going through all that. Or... What I would recommend in 2024 for all of you new agents is you should just get a monthly subscription to one of the underwriting software programs that are out there. There are two that we use. Uh, one of them is the FEX Toolkit and the other one is Best Plan Pro. Both are equally very good. I think they're both priced the same. I don't know the exact price, so don't hold me to this. I think it's roughly about 30 bucks a month for each one. You get some type of... Uh, uh, free trial. I, I don't know how much it is. It's like either a week long, or I think the other one might be a month long, but I will tell you, you, you want to get some underwriting software. Now in the long run, you should be acclimated with your carriers. Okay. You should be acclimated with your carriers and their underwriting, but starting out, this helps out a lot. When I first got into the business in 2018, uh, I don't think we had this stuff. I think the stuff started rolling out like in 2020 or 2021. I think, I don't know. I didn't know about it. So if I would have known about it back then, man, it would have made my life a whole lot easier, especially my first year, because I've made a lot of blunders. I would, I would go into a house and I would offer guaranteed issue because I thought that that's all they could get. And then I would go home and I'd realize, oh, I could get this person's first aid coverage. And then I'd go have to go over there and do a two-step if I do get a hold of them again. And, you know, just so get the underwriting software. Because all you do with the underwriting software is put in their name, their birth date, their gender. Uh, you put in uh, like their medications, their health issues, and then it'll show all of the carriers and what type of coverage, whether it be first day coverage or whether it would be uh, 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 graded or modified, it'll show the pricing. So it's really good to have, man. So once you do that, then you are going to move forward. Hey guys, on a side note, I'm gonna back up on the script. When I was in the pre-qualifying conversation, I didn't talk about if the client has any coverage. I'm actually going to do a separate video on what if a, if a prospect already has life insurance, okay? 
I'm going to do that in a separate video because it's it's a pretty lengthy lesson. And so I'm going to talk about it. Like it's going to go over adding coverage, replacing coverage, getting the existing policy and all that. So I just want to let you know, uh, I think I'm going to do it for my next video, uh, my next training video. But anyways, I just want to let you know that uh, for anyone who was thinking about it. Uh, so let's, okay, back down. We did the field underwriting. We got the health questions. We got the medications. We punched it all into our underwriting software. And now we are picking out a carrier. So on the script, just for the sake of picking a carrier, we prosperity. So we pick prosperity. So now I say, okay, well, the company that uh, I'm matching you up with is Prosperity Life. They're out of Newark, New Jersey. They've been around since 1914. And the program that you qualify for is there. And whatever they qualify for, whether it's first day coverage, graded coverage, or modified. Let's just say it's level coverage. So we'll say the program that you qualify for is the level plan. Basically, it's everything I've described. Can't be canceled due to age or health. The rates don't ever go up. And you are covered with what's known as first day 100% full coverage. And then you say this part. So first day coverage, that means you are fully covered right away from the first payment. No matter what happens, if you die by accident or natural causes, you're fully covered. And the reason I'm recommending this company and plan is because of, and you say whatever, like maybe if they're getting first day coverage, you say, because, you know, you're in fairly good health, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, you just have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And this company only takes people that are, don't have major health issues. So that's why you're getting first day coverage. Now let's say someone only qualifies for the graded plan or the modified guaranteed issue plan. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about, let's do it. Let's, let's do a lesson on pitching graded and modified coverage. The name of the game is you need to make it sound good. Make it sound good. You know, as salespeople, we can create magic. If we make something sound good, then it's good. If we make something sound, you know, okay, then it's okay. If we make something sound like a hot bag of trash, then it's a hot bag of trash. So when you're pitching graded or modified, make it sound good because it's good for that person, obviously, because they got underlying health issues that can't get them first day coverage. So let's just say the, the uh, let's just say both of these pitches right here. I just want to let you know, there's when, when when it comes to reading scripts and saying scripts there's saying a script verbatim which is like saying a script word for word and then there's what's called script adherence where maybe you mess around with the wordplay a little bit and you know you kind of you kind of add a little twist to it but script adherence means you're not skipping sections and you're getting you're getting it out there you're getting the gist of it you know there's certain things that need to be verbatim like the budget like we were talking about the budget questions you need to ask that stuff verbatim but when it comes to pitching graded or modify, modified, you know, you can kind of say it the way you want to say it. You just got to make it sound good and you got to get your point across. So let's take the graded explanation. With prosperity specifically, they have a graded plan where if somebody dies in the first year, they get 30% of the death benefit. The second year, they get 70%. And the after two years, they're fully covered. So when you say the graded pitch, you want to say something like this. Graded means you're covered for 30%. If you die, excuse me, if you die in the first year, Mrs. Prospect, your kid's going to get 30% of the death benefit. If you die in the second year, they're going to get 70% of the death benefit. And then after two years, you are going to be fully covered. And the reason that we're putting you with the graded plan is because of this health, this X health condition. And you got to understand, that's a very hard condition to cover. Many people with that condition, they can't even get coverage from other companies. So it's good that we're even getting something like this. Make it sound good. The modified plan. I personally like the modified pitch more than the graded pitch. I like the way it rolls off the tongue. So I'm going to say you're going to be covered with what's known as the modified plan. What that means, if you die within the first two years of the plan, Mr. Prospect, your son's going to get the payments you put in plus 10% interest. And this is great because your health ailments, they are very hard to cover. Most companies out there, they're just going to turn you down flat. And here's the thing too, 10% interest with your payments, 
that's more than you get in the bank. What's the bank going to give you on interest? I don't know. 1%, 2%. I don't, I don't think they're doing 3%. Maybe, maybe some. And over the long term, this is the best program because after two years, you're fully covered, regardless if your health goes down even more or how old you get. We got to make it sound good. That's, that's what it comes down to. You know, I hear agents, and I've done this myself, where it's like if once we find out that someone only qualifies for graded or modified coverage, it's like we act like we're giving them the big letdown. And, we, and the agents will start talking like this. We'll go, okay, well, the coverage that you can get is the modified plan. You know, unfortunately, I can't get first aid coverage for you. Uh, I can do this modified plan. It's just there's a two-year waiting period. So if you die in the first two years, your kid's only going to get the payments. But, you know, something is better than nothing. Wah, 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 wah. Don't be like that. If you pitch it like that, they're going to be like, I don't want that. That's a hot bag of trash, man. So make it sound good. Because for them, that is good. And I will tell you. These seniors, man, they've been around the block. These ones that have a lot of health issues, they realize that life insurance companies are not lining up single file to sell them life insurance. And a lot of them, they might have only got, they might might have only tried to get life insurance from like a PNC company, like the same company that they get their auto insurance with. They're trying to get life insurance and they get turned down because those life insurance companies that are connected to a lot of these PNC companies, they're very, very strict on health issues, man. They'll ding someone for anything, you know? So you got to watch out on that. So a lot of times when they find out that they can get life insurance, they're super excited, even with the two-year waiting period, because they didn't really think they can get anything. Make it sound good. Make it sound good. Have a smile. Have a little pep in your talk. And make it sound good. It's because it's good for them. And you ain't going to have no problems. They ain't going to give you, you have no qualms sell, selling this type of coverage to them. Okay, so you picked out a carrier. You pitched them whether they got first day immediate coverage, graded or modified coverage. Now we're going for the close. So looking at the budget you gave me to work with, I'm going to show you three programs. So I'm going to show you all how I do it. I don't know if everybody does this. I'm, you know, I'm going to tell you. I'm a little bit old school, guys. Grew up in the 80s and 90s. I ain't a millennial. We are more power to you, or whatever these other generations are uh, that are that are you know these future ones. But you know, I still like to write the options on paper. So what do I do? Let's say it's prosperity, and let's say let's say the person can afford fifty to seventy five dollars a month. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to write prosperity up top. And just for the sake of math, just for simplicity, let's say a $5,000 policy costs 50 bucks a month. Remember their range is between 50 and 75. Uh, for 75 bucks a month, they can get $7,500 in coverage. And then I'm going to write a third option that's a little bit above their budget range. I'm going to put 10,000 for 100 bucks a month. Now you might be asking, Joe, I thought we were supposed to be sensitive to their budget. Why are we writing an option that's a little bit more? Because this is how we make sure we don't leave money on the table. You know, when you were first talking about the budget, that was a, that was a little bit earlier in the game. Um, they might've had their guard up. They might've been reserved. Maybe they can afford a little more, or maybe when you show them these three options, maybe they like the bang for the buck for what they can get for a little bit more. And they pick the more expensive option. If they pick the most expensive option, the next question you should ask is, you should say, okay, I noticed you picked the more expensive option, Mrs. Jones. Would you like to would you like to see what you get for a little bit more? And if they say, yeah, I'd like to see I'd like to see what I can get for 150. And maybe they go for that. And it, we're not we're not pushing them to spend more. We're just asking. We're just asking. We got to be sensitive to the budget. Okay. 
So that's how you do it. If the budget range was 150 to 200, write an option for 150, write an option for 200, write an option for 250. If the budget was low, let's say it was 20 to 30 bucks a month, write an option for 20, write an option in the middle for 30, and write an option for 40 bucks a month. I will tell you, you will get a sinking feeling when you write three options and someone without flinching just picks the most expensive option. You're going to say to yourself, man, Maybe they can afford more than that. Maybe I'm missing out on the money and I'm missing out and they're missing out on giving more money to their family that they're probably going to need. I mean, with inflation, extra, you know, extra stuff always comes up with funerals and, and all this final expense costs. So, Hey, if they can afford it, the more money they can give to their loved ones, the better, man. Just as long as they can afford it though, man, I, I, I don't want to lose. I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose that here. We, we need to make sure they can afford it. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is I've wrote everything down and I'm going to say, here's my recommendation to you. And I'm going to give them a recommendation. When I, when I say I'm going to give them a recommendation, what I do is I go over to them, say we're at the kitchen table. I'm going to move my chair over or I might even just walk over to them and bend down. And I'm going to say their rec the recommendation, maybe if it's five seventy five hundred and ten thousand. Maybe I'll, if they want to be cremated, I'm going to say something like this. Say, here, here's my recommendation to you, Mr. Jones. Uh, you know, if you die tomorrow, 5,000, that could cover a cremation of service, you know, depending where, where you go. Uh, but if you want to battle inflation, if you live another 10, 20 years, then yeah, it's going to cost 75 or it's going to cost uh, 7,500 or it's going to cost 10,000. So I would recommend maybe doing the middle or the other option if you can afford it. But do what, no, do what you know is in your budget. So out of these three, which one do you want to start today? You hand them the paper and you don't say nothing. So I think a lot of us in sales, I hope you know that once you close and you ask for the business, you need to be quiet. You need to shut up. You need to let them look at the paper or look at the prices and don't say anything. This is the part where they need to process everything. They need to have some me time. They're looking at the coverage. They're looking at the pricing. They're thinking about their budget. They're thinking about what they need exactly. They're thinking about their loved ones. They're thinking about how much money they really want to give to them. They need to like be in the zone. If you say out of these three, which one are we going to start today? And they're looking at the paper and you say something like 20 seconds later and, and they didn't say, you're going to mess up their thought pattern. You know what that's going to filter out to? It's going to filter out to, oh, I need to think about it. So do not mess up their train of thought, okay? I don't care if an uncomfortable two, three, five minutes goes on. That's okay. It's all right. You know what? Just get on your phone and get, I don't know, get on your Facebook or Instagram account. Look at your emails. Do something, do, do something and leave them alone, okay? Be ready to rebuttal them, but leave them alone. Now, maybe they'll ask a question. Maybe they won't pick an option right away. Maybe they'll ask a question about the policy. Let's say they're looking at the paper and they say, okay, you told me uh, wh when, how long am I going to be able to have this insurance and what age is it going to cancel? You need to answer the question and then you need to reclose. So let's say that was a question. How long am I going to be able to have this insurance? And you answer and you say, yeah. This insurance is going to be with you for life. It's never going to cancel due to age or health. And then you reclose. So out of these three, which one are you going to start today? I want to tell salesmanship 101. Salespeople in a sales call should always have control. How do you do that? Every time you stop talking, you need to either be asking a question or closing. What you don't want to do is just be answering a question and waiting for the person to say something so you can answer a answer them again, okay? So if they ask a question about the policy, hey, how long is the price gonna stay $75 a month if I pick that, Joe? It's gonna stay like that forever. It's gonna be a price lock. It's never gonna go up $1. It's always gonna be $75 a month, Mrs. Jones. So out of these three, which one are we gonna start today? Just like that. We need to keep laying the closing pressure on them. Like we just, we, I don't mean pressure. We need to keep putting the ball in their court to make a decision. You know what I mean? 
as soon as they pick an option, you say, great, okay, spell your beneficiary and just write on scratch paper, even though we're doing electronic applications, most likely, just spell it to kind of transition into the application process. Once they spell their beneficiary's name, I what I say is I say, great, well, the first thing I need is your ID and I'm going to get this going for you. And then boom, you get right into the application process, man. So that's the close. Now, yeah, sometimes they're going to rebuttal. I'm sorry, sometimes they're going to object and you're going to have to rebuttal. So as face-to-face -face agents, I would tell you the two most, uh, two most common objections are going to be, I need to think about it. I need to speak to my kids. There's these other two right here. I will tell you, these are more telesales objections. I'm not giving out my social security number or I'm not giving out my bank account. You know, that, that's one pro about face-to-face uh, -face work is if we go through the whole presentation and they pick out an option and we start doing the application, like they'll give us their personal info all day. In the last six years I've been doing this, I think I can think of maybe, I can think of like, I think twice that someone didn't want to want to give out their info, you know? Man, with telesales, you already know. Uh, it's once they pick out an option, you ain't all in the clear. You got to start doing this application over the phone. You got to start asking for their personal info. And I, I know there's there's telesales people are very very good at doing this. But uh, and I'm not saying have your guard down all the way, but I'm just saying as a face to face agent, you're really not going to have to deal with this one and this one so much as far as objection handling. It's going to be more the, I need to think about it. I need to speak to my kids. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I need you to understand the mindset of when a prospect objects at the end. It ain't a big deal, guys. It's not a big deal. Objections at the end of the presentation are like objections at the door. It's just knee-jerk reaction stuff. When they say they need to think about it or they need to speak to their kids, you don't need to get into this long conversation about why they need to think about it. We just need to say our rebuttal and close, okay? So, like, understand this. When they object at the door, all that's really happening is they are saying that they have anxiety over a sales cycle, okay? Every objection at the door, I'm not interested. I, can you email me something? It all comes down to, I don't want to be in a sales cycle. I'm not interested because I don't want to be in a sales cycle. I, uh, can you email me something? Because I don't want to be in a sales cycle. I have life insurance. Therefore, we don't need to talk. And I don't, I want to be in a, I don't want to be in a sales cycle. So at the end, at the presentation, when they start saying they need to think about it or talk to their kids, they're just having buyer's anxiety. OK, all of the logic was in the presentation. We already had logical conversations. We talked about why you filled out the form. We talked about the problem that's going to happen when you die. You admitted how you, you, you want to do this, that it's going to bother you if your kids are going to have to pay. We talked about your budget. We went through everything. OK, so all of this is just need your reaction stuff. So don't freak out when they say they need to think about it. You know what you do? Unlike a lot of salespeople that want to start arguing with prospects at the end. Oh man, we still want to be in their side. We just talk to them. So it goes a little something like this. They say, I need to think about it. You go, that's fine, Mr. Jones. I can understand why you feel that way. When you, when you say you need to think about it, like how do you mean? And they say whatever. And you say, okay, well, besides X, is there any other issues that need to be addressed before making a decision? And they'll say, no, no, it's just that. I just want to think about it for a minute. Okay, great. Well, here's my proposition. You said your daughter is going to have to charge up a credit card and there's nothing to think about on that. And bottom line, we don't even know if you could qualify for this plan and your health today, it's not promised tomorrow, right? Right. And isn't some coverage better than no coverage? And here's the thing, Mr. Jones, we can always add more coverage later. So spell your beneficiary's name. Rebuttals need to be quick. Just, you know, what, they got to have timing. One, two, three, one, two, three. Who's your beneficiary going to be for all you music people out there? You know, but don't make, don't add a lot of fluff. Don't make them all long. You just say it smoothly. And then 
the close is the most important. And this is where agents mess up. Agents will rebuttal at this part, but they won't do the close. What's the close? You take your pen, you put it to the paper, and you look down and you say, okay, Mrs. Jones, spell your beneficiary's name. So I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do just the main section right here. Great. Well, here's my proposition, Mr. Prospect. And oh, and, and by the way, I'll start over. Sorry, guys. In the brackets, explain why they need to buy today. Just throw the problem in their face again. If the problem is that your kids are going to have to do uh, a car wash, it goes like this. Okay. Well, here's my proposition, Mr. Prospect. You said if you die today, your kids are going to have to do a car wash, man. And bottom line, we don't even know if you qualify for this. And your health today isn't promised tomorrow, right? And isn't some coverage better than no coverage? Yeah, of course. And here's the thing. We can always add more coverage later. So spell your beneficiary's name. Just like that. Hey, I'm going to be honest. When I first seen this rebuttal, I was like, man, this stuff ain't going to work. I ain't going to say who's your beneficiary and they're just going to do it. And I remember the first time I did it. If you listen to any of my interviews, there's a point in my career where I decided to follow all of David Duford's system. And one of them, and part of that was doing things even if I either didn't agree with it or I, I thought it wasn't going to work. And so the rebuttal, I was like, man, this ain't going to work. But you know what? I, I, I practiced it. I practiced it. And one day I went out to the field and I said, I'm, I, I like was so looking forward to someone to say, I need to think about it. I was like, I'm going to say this rebuttal. And I remember I said the rebuttal and I said, and, and, it's, and the guy's son was going to be the beneficiary. And I said, so spell your son's name. And he spelled the son's name after saying he wanted to think about it. And then I said, great. Well, the first thing I need is your ID and we'll get this going. And I did the application and I closed and I'll tell you the whole time that I was doing the application, man, I was saying in my head, I was like, man, I can't believe that rebuttal worked. And you know why though? Because they really want to do it. They're just having some buyer's anxiety. The way that the rebuttals are set up is it's just getting them off the fence. They're just procrastinating, man. A lot of these final expense prospects, they have a, a nature of procrastination, a behavior of procrastination, putting stuff off. And I'm not trying to talk down. I, I care about these people, man. I'm just saying how it is. I want to help me and help them and their family. So the rebuttal is set up not to get into a big conversation. We ain't got to open up a big old can of worms or none of that stuff. No, you just say the rebuttal, you say it smoothly, and then you say, now spell your son's name to get some off the fence to do this. And, and I will tell you, I, there's been so many times that someone said they need to think about it. <clears throat> I said the rebuttal and we did the application. We got them approved. And they said to me, they said, you know what? Thanks for Thanks for kind of nudging me on doing that, Joe. I actually feel really good about this. I, I feel really good. I'm, it's like, give me a lot of peace. I'm just glad I did it. And that feels really good, man. Talk about a gratifying point in our business when someone says that to you. And you did your job, man. You helped that family. You need to rebuttal, okay? And just do it in a non-defensive manner, you know? I can understand the way you feel. I want you to think about it, Mr. Jones. Just When you say you need to think about it, like, how do you mean? Okay, well, besides X, is there any other issues that need to be addressed? You know, just have that demeanor like you're still, you're on their side, you know? And the, I need to, th I need to speak to my kids. I think it's a really powerful one. So this one, they say, I need to speak to my kids. And I, what I like to say is I go, great, yeah, I want, I want you to speak to your kids. Like, I don't want to keep you from doing anything you don't want to do, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I want you to speak to your kids. So, so here's, here's my proposition. Mr. Jones, I think we both agree that your children would rather you have coverage or not having it, right? I mean, can you imagine your kids pulling $15,000 out of nowhere to pay for your final expenses? And think about this. Would you expect your grandkids to pay for your kid's funeral? Yeah, of course not. So let's get you qualified for this plan and you can show your kids after the fact and I'll answer any questions that arise in the future. So spell your daughter's name. Just like that. I'm telling you, man, this stuff works. It works, but you got to close. That's the thing. Agents will rebuttal, but they won't close. They won't take their pen to the paper and say, so, so who's your beneficiary going to be? That's what it takes. Hey, guys, I hope that helped. So you want to be a part of the training around here? Shameless plug. <laughs> if you want to be part of the DIG agency career program, the face-to-face -face career program, where we give you fresh exclusive leads and you run them and I will coach you and mentor you and be your accountability partner, go to daviddeford.com. That's daviddeford.com. 
click the apply button. And when you're filling out the application, put, I want to do face-to-face -face sales and put, I want free leads and we will contact you. All right. And that I will see you at the next video and God bless you all. Take care.